Bonsoir. Donc, on va commencer. Donc, merci d'être venu. J'espère que vous êtes assez cosy dans la salle. Euh, on a Don ici qui est en train de traduire euh, pour vous. Et merci à tout le monde pour l'organisation de cet événement. Merci à Tim d'être arrivé hier. Il va passer aussi demain avec les doctorants euh, avant de repartir en Écosse. Et donc, Tim Mingold, c'est un professeur de l'Université d'Aberdeen, un anthropologue. Et c'est un projet euh, entre trois structures, donc l'ITR euh, et PACT, et la structure fédérative de recherche, qui a voulu inviter Tim euh, pour euh, irriguer nos pratiques et penser à la fois dans la création, dans les pratiques en social et aussi en, littérat en littérature. Bien, bonsoir. Euh, donc, euh, au nom de nos deux laboratoires, donc l'ITR pour Gretchen Schiller et Pacte pour moi-même, de la structure fédérative de recherche création de toute l'université euh, Grenoble-Alpes, nous sommes vraiment ravis d'accueillir euh, avec nous donc, le professeur Tim Ingold, euh, que pour certains, il n'est pas besoin de présenter. Je reviendrai simplement rapidement sur euh, euh, la carrière de cet anthropologue hors pair qui... Euh, qui est en train de finir un tout petit livre qui s'appelle « Why Anthropology Matters », pourquoi l'anthropologie est importante. Et ça nous concerne directement à Grenoble, puisqu'il n'y a pas de département d'anthropologie. Donc, euh, avec une conférence d'une heure, on vous propose de rattraper tout ce qui ne peut pas se faire pendant le reste de l'année. Euh, donc, T. Mingold est, a été formé à, à Cambridge. Et il, a, il, a fait une, il a commencé en, fait en biologie, en sciences naturelles, avant de bifurquer vers l'anthropologie sociale, dont il est un des principaux représentants aujourd'hui. Euh, il est déjà venu à Grenoble dans une discussion très, euh, très fructueuse avec Philippe Descola, qui a été publié depuis. Si on peut passer la diapositive suivante, en fait, vous verrez simplement apparaître euh, les, princi Alors, de très, les principaux livres qui sont traduits en français. Euh, vous avez au moins les titres qui sont visibles. On pas, euh, la, la diapositive ne, ne, ne donnera rien de loin, j'en suis désolée. Donc simplement pour revenir sur la carrière de Tim, euh, il a donc euh, fait une thèse au départ sur les populations euh, circumpolaires euh, et euh, il a regardé les questions en fait, d'habiter, d'habiter l'espace de façon plus ou moins mobile, selon qu'on était pasteur, selon qu'on était chasseur ou bien fermier. Euh, et il a travaillé donc sur un rapport à l'espace qui, qui était tout à fait différent de celui de notre monde occidental. Comme beaucoup d'anthropologues, il est allé s'inspirer d'un ailleurs. Mais depuis de très nombreuses années, il est revenu vers chez nous, vers nos pratiques à nous. Et il interroge le quotidien, en fait, euh, de ce qui tisse notre lien à l'espace. Et donc, il est en cela très proche de l'ethnologie, de la géographie euh, et euh, d'une géographie environnementale telle que nous aimons la pratiquer ici, notamment à, à Grenoble. Euh, il a donc, euh, suite à son doctorat, euh, qui a été, euh, qui a été euh, mené en, en lien avec... Euh, l'université du nord-est de la Finlande. Il a enseigné à l'université de Helsinki, puis à Manchester, où il est devenu le professeur de la chaire Mag Lukman. Et il est depuis maintenant près de 18 ans à l'université d'Aberdeen. Il, il a reçu un doctorat honoris causa de diverses universités, notamment en Allemagne, à Lefana. Euh, C'est quelqu'un dont euh, la contribution à la littérature anthropologique euh, est très, très nombreuse. Et, euh, il est difficile de citer toute son œuvre. Donc, j'ai retenu, en fait, euh, sur la diapositive qui est au-dessus, les livres qui avaient été traduits en français, et j'en ai oublié un, qui est « Marché avec les dragons euh, ». Donc, une brève histoire des lignes, qui est le premier euh, ouvrage à être traduit en français, si je ne m'abuse, en 2011, qui le fait connaître. Marcher avec, ah oui, marcher avec les dragons est là. Euh, ensuite, cette fameuse discussion à laquelle vous avez peut-être assisté à la Maison de la Culture dans le cadre de la Villa Gilet, euh, qui avait eu lieu donc, euh, entre Philippe Descola et lui, qui sont des anthropologues qui travaillent beaucoup ensemble, mais qui ne sont pas d'accord sur tout, et c'est vraiment intéressant euh, de les voir discuter. Et donc, cette, euh, ce dialogue a été rapporté sur, à par écrit, et vous pouvez le partager. Euh, et le, dernièrement, donc, Faire anthropologie, archéologie, art et architecture, publié aux éditions Dehors. Son dernier livre porte sur l'anthropologie et l'éducation, 
euh, et il est actuellement euh, en cours de traduction en français. Donc euh, maintenant, en fait, voilà, le, le monde académique français et le monde intellectuel français euh, se met en fait euh, en, à l'heure de Timingold de, de façon un peu plus régulière. Euh, donc nous sommes particulièrement heureux de l'avoir à Grenoble, non seulement pour cette grande conférence ce soir, euh, et aussi donc pour demain une petite journée de travail qui est organisée pour les chercheurs des, des, des euh, laboratoires Littéar et euh, Pacte, euh, qui se passera au musée dauphinois, qui a aussi joué le jeu de ce partenariat culturel d'exception, ravi de, de, voilà, de, 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 de dialoguer en leur sein avec un, un anthropologue qui leur manque tant à Grenoble. Si d'aventure vous êtes intéressé en fait, par la participation à cette journée, venez me voir à la fin. Il y a, le nombre de places n'est pas complètement limité, même si la salle est beaucoup plus petite qu'aujourd'hui, donc on aurait du mal euh, à vous accueillir toutes et tous. Pour ce soir, euh, je passe rapidement la parole pour la fin de l'introduction à Gretchen Schiller, avant de donner... Euh, voilà, de laisser, tu veux dire quelque chose de plus ou on donne tout de suite la parole à... Bon, bonne écoute et merci Tim, c'est all yours. You have to just give them a little. Uh, thank you, Gretchen, and thank you, Anne Laure. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here with you tonight. The greater part of what we know, we cannot explain. And this is savoir faire or know how. The philosopher Michael Polanyi called it personal knowledge, knowledge that adheres so closely to the person of the practitioner that it cannot be held up to scrutiny or posited as an object of reflection or analysis. Without it, Polanyi argued, nothing could be practicably accomplished. We couldn't tie our shoelaces, beat an egg, hold a pen, or ride a bicycle. <clears throat> But nor for that matter could we design a building, solve an equation, or compose a symphony. In these, as in countless other tasks, we feel our way forward, as Polanyi put it, following a trail and relaying it as we go, instead of executing a predetermined and fully articulated program of explicit rules or representations. It's not that there are no rules at all, but rather than furnishing the pegs that underpin the landscape of action, they more resemble signposts in the landscape itself, which point us in the direction we need to go. They are what we call rules of thumb, offering guidance without specification. In practice, they are more ostensive than prescriptive. <clears throat> Once set upon a course, we rely upon the reservoir of personal knowledge to carry on. To strip away the veneer of articulate representations for Polanyi was, and I quote, to lay bare the inarticulate manifestations of intelligence by which we know things in a purely personal manner, and to reveal an immense mental domain, not only of knowledge, but of manners, of laws, and of the many different arts by which man knows how to use, comply with, enjoy, or live by without specifiably knowing their contents. Now here, as elsewhere, <clears throat> Polanyi could hardly have been more emphatic that what his inquiries had disclosed was a realm of mind, he called it a mental domain, the existence of which had previously been unacknowledged or until then had not been accorded its due. And yet his discovery was destined to suffer an ignominious fate at the hands of subsequent social theory, <clears throat> which had, albeit belatedly, realized that human beings are only present in the world because they have, or rather are, their bodies. And this realization is commonly traced back to an influ influential essay on techniques of the body, technique du corps, penned by the ethnologist Marcel Mauss, in 1934. Drawing attention to the sheer diversity of postures and gestures involved in such everyday tasks as walking, carrying loads, eating and sleeping, most realize that there is more to this than the kind of idiosyncratic variation that marks one individual from another and that in French would be called habitude. 
It's not just a matter of what you might happen to pick up or conversely of what you might improvise for yourself. Some children, most noted, are more inclined than others to imitate the behavior they observe around them, and yet both weak and strong imitators, if they belong to the same society, are similarly educated by example and correction into forms of bodily comportment deemed proper to their age and status. To denote these forms, socially imposed rather than individually acquired, attributable to education rather than imitation, and thus enshrined in a tradition, most co-opted the term habitus. Now, Moses' prospectus for a comparative ethnology of techniques of the body was sketchy at best, and was soon forgotten by the anthropology of the time. With its fragmentary catalogue of apparently miscellaneous customs from around the world, the essay was so anachronistic in its formulation, and yet so far ahead of its time in terms of the questions it opened up, that it largely fell on deaf ears. So when, some 40 years later, the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu reintroduced the habitus as the centerpiece of a theory of practice centered upon dispositions of the body, few recalled that he was following the precedent set by Mauss, nor did Bourdieu go out of his way to acknowledge the fact. And perhaps it's as well that he didn't, because he took the term in a quite different sense. By habitus, Bourdieu means a kind of practical mastery, a capacity to improvise conduct strategically attuned to the conditions of its production, that is neither picked up has has haphazardly, as one might pick up an infection, simply through personal contact, nor deliberately inculcated through precept and prescription. Every society, Bourdieu writes, provides for structural exercises tending to transmit this or that form of practical mastery. They are exercises in which a body participates not as an instrumental means for the implementation or expression of a moral tradition, but as a productive agent in its own right. Its postures and gestures, far from merely expressing thoughts and feelings already imparted through an education into societal values, are themselves ways of thinking and feeling through which these values are continually reproduced. Now, crucially, according to Bourdieu, the principles of mastery that are passed on by way of these exercises never rise to what he calls the level of discourse. Psychologically, they remain underground, beyond the reach of consciousness. They cannot be articulated or rendered explicit. Ineffable, incommunicable, and therefore inimitable by any conscious effort, these principles are given body, made body, or literally embodied, as Bourdieu puts it, by the hidden persuasion of an implicit pedagogy. Now, so far as I know, Bourdieu makes no reference to the work of Polanyi. He might not even have read it. But there are many uncanny parallels between Polanyi's notion of personal knowledge and the particular construction that Bourdieu places on the habitus. The claim that Polanyi makes for personal knowledge, that it cannot be articulated or specified, that it is non-propositional and non-declarative, that it is acquired and deployed without conscious awareness, or in a word, that it is tacit, <coughs> but that it subtends and makes possible everything we think and do, is precisely the claim that Bourdieu makes for the habitus. It's not surprising, therefore, that for the generation of social scientists brought up on Bourdieu, and I am one of them, the temptation is to look back at Polanyi through Bourdieuvian spectacles <coughs> and to jump to the conclusion that by personal or tacit knowledge, he meant a knowledge whose proper domain is the body. Indeed, Polanyi has even been criticized in his insistence on the division between tacit and explicit knowledge 
for reproducing a Cartesian dualism of body and mind. In the vocabulary of many analysts, tacit and embodied have come to mean the same thing. And yet nothing could have been further from Polanyi's intention. For as I have already noted, he was emphatic in his verdict that personal knowledge inhabits the mind. If there's a division between explicit and tacit, it is between two regions of the mind and not between mind and body. Now in this lecture, I want to take issue with the notion of embodied knowledge by focusing on what I should call habit, the habit of craftsmen, artisans, musicians, and scholars. My argument has two components. The first is to show that habits, the habits that enable practitioners to move on in the accomplishment of their tasks are not so much sedimented in the body as generated and enacted in an attentive and kinesthetic correspondence with tools, materials, and environment. And the second is to insist that this is as true of working with words as it is of working with nonverbal materials. To reach the domain of habitual practice, then, does not mean giving up on words or probing beneath them. But it does mean giving up on the techniques of intellectual distillation that allow words to float to the top and habits to think to the bottom of, an ima of some imaginary column of consciousness. And these techniques, I contend, are themselves sustained and reproduced in the practices of the academy. For who, other than academics, would be so pompous as to exclude from discourse anything that cannot be expressed in formal propositional terms? Who else would dismiss as inarticulate or even sublinguistic any expressions that do not conform to standards of logical rigor. It is in their minds and theirs alone that the myth persists of the silent craftsman, apparently struck dumb when challenged to tell of what he does or how he does it. True, he might not be able to spell it out in explicit detail, but this does not mean that he is lost for words. It is one thing to argue that habits resist explication, quite another that they resist verbalization. And that the two have become confused owes much to the ambiguities inherent in the notion of the tacit. And it's to these that I turn first of all. Whereof one cannot speak, concluded Ludwig Wittgenstein in the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Taken literally, this austere pronouncement would consign to an ocean of silence all ways of knowing and doing, all wisdom and experience, save that which can be expressed linguistically or mathematically in the form of logically interconnected propositions. Now, it was Polanyi's contention, of course, that these expressions amounted to no more than the tip of an iceberg, the overwhelming mass of which lay submerged beneath the waves. His purpose was not to denigrate this submarine dimension, but to highlight its contribution to thought and practice. The things of which we cannot speak, he would say, are also things without which we cannot do. Or as he put it in introducing a set of lectures entitled The Tacit Dimension, we can know more than we can tell. But why did he choose the word tacit to denote this untold and untellable residue? The word itself is tantalizingly vague. It's derived from the Latin tacere, to be silent, and it refers in the first place to that which remains unvoiced. And yet, voiced sounds need not be verbal, and verbal utterances need have no explicit propositional content. 
What are we to make, for example, of a song without words? And what of an utterance, the force of which is elocutionary, such as a warning, a greeting, or a direction? Conversely, of many things that could be stated explicitly, we might prefer to keep our mouths shut for reasons of discretion or security. As the philosopher of science Harry Collins explains in an extended commentary on the explicit tacit distinction, whether a matter is voiced or even verbal is not really the issue for Polanyi. The tacit for him is not so much the opposite of explicit as of explicable. It consists of things that cannot, by their very nature, be explicated. So, what does Polanyi mean by explication? And two terms creep cropping up in his account of what it entails, namely specification and articulation. To specify means to pin things down to fixed coordinates of reference. To articulate means to join them up into a complete structure. So we specify when we plot dot dots on a graph or enter values in an equation or type words on a page. We articulate when we join them up, dots with lines, values with plus or minus signs, words with spaces. And as these examples indicate, explication is not limited to verbal forms. It may also be algebraic or mathematical or expressed in the peculiar language of symbolic logic. And it may also occur in the conventions of musical notation, where each note is specified by a dot and where the dots are joined into phrases by ligatures. So what do the graph, the mathematical equation, the written sentence, and the scored phrase have in common? They have in common that they are all absolutely silent. Where everything is pinned down and joined up, nothing can move. And without movement, there can be no sound. Specification and articulation, while they may be the keys to logical explication, lock the doors to movement, to sound, and to feeling. They stop it up. But this brings us to a rather surprising result. It is that nothing so effectively silences the world than rendering it in explicit propositional terms. It is indeed the explicit that is tacit, not the reservoir of habit or know-how for which Polanyi reserved the term. Habit, on the other hand, is turbulent and sometimes noisy. It swirls around between the points that explicit knowledge joins up, like waters flowing around and between the islands of an archipelago. So I think we have been persistently misled by the analogy of the iceberg with the picture it presents of explicit knowledge and the tip at the tip and the mass of inexplicable know-how below. For far from having come to rest, frozen in submarine psychocorporeal depths, know-how is restless, fluid, and dynamic. And above all, it is not deposited as a stable substrate housed in lower levels of consciousness, but is fundamentally animate, imminent in the sensuousness of a body that is mobile, alive, and open to the world. Such a body, unified not anatomically, but in its affective resonances, far from retreating into silence, dwells in sound. Habits, in short, are not embodied. Rather, the body, in its habitation of the world, is ensounded. Consider, for example, what happens when I play a single note on an open string of my cello. On the score, the note is specified by a dot crossed by a stave line. There it is, silent, lifeless, and inert. But as soon as I begin to play, it erupts into sound, into life. The notated point becomes a sustained and vibrant line. This is, 
no simple matter, and to su succeed in it, my body must be finely balanced and tensed throughout, elbow and wrist under while my right arm, elbow and wrist undergo a controlled movement to ensure that the position where the bow touches the string between bridge and fingerboard remains more or less constant. The sound arises from this complex choreography of highly attentive, mutually attuned movements. It is not possible to play without also feeling, without continually attending and responding both to one's own movements and to those going on in one's surrounding. Indeed, in bowing a note on the cello, as in any other task, as even Polanyi acknowledged, we feel our way forward. Yet in the appeal to the tacit, this entire domain of feeling is blanked out, silenced, and stilled. Tacit, in short, is a misnomer for the dimension of habitual practice. So by what better term should it be known? I'd like to borrow a concept from educational theorist Stefano Harney and literary scholar Fred Moten, namely hapticality. It lies in their words in the feel for feeling others feeling you. In effect, hapticality fills the void of the tacit. Where the tacit is silent, the haptic is noisy. Where the tacit is embodied, the haptic is animate. Where the tacit is sunk into the depths of being, the haptic is open and alive to others and to the world. And with this, we can return to Wittgenstein's injunction from the Tractatus. The composer, John Cage, began his lecture on nothing, presented in New York in 1949, by declaring, I have nothing to say, and I am saying it. Now, behind the play on words, Cage was being deeply serious. We could read his declaration as a forthright rebuke to the author of the Tractatus. For Cage refuses to be silenced. His words may have no object, no referent, no matter to convey, yet he has a voice and will speak. And it behoves us to listen. For by speaking, we humans make ourselves present in the world, and by listening, we pay attention and respond. Cage wanted to awaken in his listeners their sense of what he called responsibility. Nor need this be limited to the sphere of human relations. Other kinds of beings or other phenomena make their presence felt in manifold ways, and we should attend to them too. We hear the calls of birds, the rustling of wind in the trees, the sound of a waterfall, and we can tell much from them, whether the birds are calm or agitated, whether the wind is gentle or strong, whether the river is dry or in spate. Neither the birds, nor the trees, nor the water have anything to say, but there they are saying it, pronouncing their very existence in the world. So does hapticality lie on the far side of speaking or of telling? Only if, with Wittgenstein, we limit speaking to logical expression, or with Polanyi, limit telling to literate articulation. Yet in truth, no words could be spoken, nor could any story be told without feeling. Both speaking and telling have another side, a side that, just as in playing the cello, is enacted in performance at the moment when connected points give way to swirling lines. At this stage of my argument, I want to focus on telling, and I'll return to speaking in due course when I move on from works to words. Now, recall that for Polanyi, we can know more than we can tell. I want to argue to the contrary that we can tell all we know, but only because there is more to telling than articulation. To tell is one of those ancient verbs that comes to us already densely encrusted with multiple layers of meaning. Originally, it was to count 
or to reckon, as does the teller who tots up the bill, whose modern representative is the accountant. An account rendered in words rather than numbers, however, is a narrative, a story. So what is the difference between the accountant and the storyteller? One adds up, assembling in rows or columns initially separate point-specific entries. This, as we have seen, is the work of articulation. But the other, the storyteller, goes along, finding a way between and through the accountant's entry points. Storytellers are wayfarers, and like all wayfarers, they need to attend to things as they go, to recognize subtle cues in the environment, and to respond to them with judgment and precision. They need to be able to tell, for example, where animals have been from their tracks, how the weather is about to change, how the river runs. That's the sense of telling I invoked a moment ago in relation to the birds, the wind, and the waterfall, and it is precisely what Cage meant by responsibility. Now, each of these two latter ways of telling, evinced respectively in storytelling and in responsibility, entails the other, because it's through having their stories told that novices learn to attend to things and to what they afford in the situations of their current practice. And contrarywise, it is because of the resulting feel for things, that is, from a kind of intimacy that comes from sharing a life together, that experienced practitioners can tell their stories. So the capacity to tell in these twinned senses is critical to the practice of, of any craft, and it is perhaps the principal criterion by which the master can be distinguished from the novice. On the one hand, stories allow practitioners to tell of what they know without specifying it. They carry no information in themselves, no coded messages or representations. They rather offer guidance or directions which listeners, finding themselves in a situation similar to that related in the story, can recognize and follow. On the other hand, responsibility allows practitioners to tune their movements to the ever-varying conditions of a task as it unfolds. This, and not in the practiced ability to execute standardized movements with greater speed or ergonomic efficiency, this is where real skill resides. <clears throat> in both senses, then, craft is a way of telling. It is a way, however, that abhors explication. It sets nothing down in advance, nor does it project a future outcome in the present. What it does do is offer an itinerary, a path to follow along which one can keep on going. It is about feeling forward, about anticipation rather than prediction. So in the zone of hapticality, telling proceeds not by integration, but by differentiation, not by adding or joining up what began as discrete pre-specified entries in the book of accounts, but by finding a way through the interstices of a field of practice. It means joining with others, including the materials with which one works, along with other people and things in the environment, feeling them as they are feeling you, while at the same time distinguishing your own line from theirs. In short, haptic telling is a process of what I have elsewhere called interstitial differentiation. It's a differentiation that proceeds along the way in a cycle of attention and response. So in, waf in wayfaring, in playing a musical instrument, in the practice of any craft, decisions have continually to be made. One decides to veer in this direction or that. But while every decision is a cut, this cut goes along the grain of action, but not across it, splitting it like an ax through timber. This is what skill is about, not imposing form on matter, but finding the grain of things 
and bending it to an evolving purpose. It's no accident that the word skill has its roots in Middle Low German schillen, meaning to make a difference, and in the Old Norse skilja, meaning to divide, separate, distinguish, or decide, nor that it shares an etymological affinity with the word shell, which is a casing opened up by splitting or cleaving along the grain. So every split amounts to what the philosopher Erin Manning calls an inflection. That is, not a movement in itself, but a variation in the way movement moves. In music, for example, a simple two-note phrase, which in notation appears as two discrete art dots articulated by a line, emerges in performance as a linear movement that bends at a point of inflection where one pitch transitions into the other. So what on the score is an exterior articulation in performance is interstitial differentiation. Now all this attention and response, all these decisions, are surely proof that craft practitioners are thinking. Indeed, it has become almost a cliche to say that musicians or craftspeople think with their fingers, with their hands, their wrists, lungs and trunk, indeed, with the whole body. <clears throat> but have you ever wondered why we should think that thinking should be silent or that it should be invisible? Surely, if thinking is not <clears throat> tacit, but as haptic as feeling is, if it is not buried in the body but overflows into the environment, if it unfolds in the telling, then it can be just as noisy. And we can watch it too. By what curious logic <clears throat> are we led to suppose that while we can watch the gestures of the potter as they caress the clay on the wheel, or hear the bowing of the cellist on the strings, the thought of both cellist and potter remains both invisible and inaudible. This logic is perhaps the legacy of a Cartesian division between cognition and action that continues to plague much theorizing on these matters. For with this div division, every deliberate action must be preceded, preceded by a thought which it serves to execute. Inevitably then, thought breaks into action, interrupts it, gets in the way, it can even be said to paralyze action, as in the apocryphal story of the millipede, which, when asked how it managed to coordinate the movement of its thousand legs, never moved again. And yet, manifestly, craftspeople are not paralyzed by thought, for they are perfectly capable of thinking, even of reflecting on what they are doing and of assessing their work without ever breaking away from practice. Reflection, as the anthropologist Anna Portish writes, reflection is a constitutive aspect of all levels of practice. Now, Portish pitches her critique against many students of craft practice, myself included, who have argued that the frequent need to reflect on progress or to stop and check is typical of novice practitioners, giving their work a jerky or stop-go character, which gradually disappears with increasing mastery of the craft. In this view, the more fluent the practitioner, the less reflective the practice. But from her own study of women's crafts in Mongolia, Portish concludes to the contrary, that reflection and assessment are integral to the practices of novices and accomplished craftswomen alike. Learning a craft, she argues, is at every level a process that is both dynamic and responsive, involving a continual dialogue with one's environment. Now, I am persuaded by her argument, but I still wonder whether reflection and assessment mean quite the same thing for the novice as for the old hand. It seems to me that the difference lies in the extent to which the practitioner has incorporated the tools and the materials of her trade 
as well as other salient constituents of the environment, into the dialogue itself. True, the old hand is as thoughtful, as meditative, and as reflective as the novice, if not more so. But perhaps she's thinking with things rather more than she is thinking about them, letting them in as accessory to her own reflections. Perhaps her thinking is that of a mind that is not confined within the body, but a mind that extends outwards to include tools, materials, and surrounding conditions, or what the philosopher of cognition, Andy Clark, calls its wideware. Could the measure of enskillment, then, lie in the distal extension of the mind, radiating outwards from its seat in the body? And the answer depends on how we choose to describe the mind. For Clark, the mind is essentially a computational device that works to produce solutions to problems posed by the environment on the basis of information received. But this device may include extrasomatic components. A mathematician, for example, may use pencil and notepad to perform a calculation, and a navigator takes up ruler and compass to plot a course. Thus, pencil and paper in the one case, and ruler and compass in the other, are integral to the extended mind of mathematician and navigator, respectively. <clears throat> now, to explain what he means by the extended mind and by way of analogy, Clark asks us to consider the prodigious talents of a fish, the bluefin tuna. Why, Clark asks, can the tuna swim so fast? The answer is that it couples its own bodily energies to the fluid dynamics of the water through which it swims, setting up eddies and vortices through the swishing of its tail and fins, which themselves exert a propulsive momentum beyond any muscular force of which the fish alone is capable. Swimming, then, is not an achievement of the fish by itself, but of what Clark calls a swimming machine comprised by the fish in its proper context, the fish plus the surrounding structures and vortices that it actively creates and then maximally exploits. So, strictly speaking, it's not the fish that swims, but the fish in the water. And it's just the same, he suggests, with the mathematician and the navigator. If the totality fish plus eddies plus vortices constitutes a mechanism for swimming, so the totality mathematician plus pencil plus notepad or navigator plus ruler plus compass comprises a mechanism for computation. The cognitive machine, in the human case, is extended in just the same way that the swimming machine is for the fish. Or is it? I am not so sure that swimming can be understood in such mechanical terms. After all, edges and vortices cannot exactly be connected up like the wheels, cranks, and pistons of an engine in such a way as to deliver propulsion as a motor effect. They are energetic movements in themselves, as indeed is the fish. Or to borrow an expression from the philosopher Stanley Cavell, the fish in the water, like every other living being in its proper medium, is a whirl. It is not an object that moves, but the emergent form of a movement. Might the fish, then, offer a better analogy for why the thinking that goes into craft practice cannot be understood in computational terms? Perhaps we should say of this thinking, too, that it is a churning of the mind, as it stirs up and is in turn stirred by the sounds and feelings of its milieu. How, how can a player, armed only with a cello, make such an immense and variable sound? How can a potter, armed only with a wheel, turn clay into the myriad forms of jugs and vessels? And how can the scribe, 
armed only with a pen, turn parchment into text. Not surely, because the practitioner's brain, body and instrument joined together make up a machine, whether for playing, potting or writing. I do not take up my cello and bow as I might a notepad and pencil or ruler and compass in order to achieve results that I could not accomplish unaided because I am not chained anatomically to the instrument. Rather, my breath, touch, manual gesture and spinal posture join in unison with wood, hair and metal. And it's the same for the potter whose hands join with the clay in the rotation of the wheel in such a way as to give form to the contours of feeling. And it is the same for the scribe whose every gesture leaves its mark by way of the pen on the writing surface. In every case, the anatomical unity of practitioner plus instrument gives way to a hapticality of sensory awareness and vital materials. And it's for this reason that I believe we should resist the temptation to describe mind, body and world as overlapping circles which in their enlargement are inclined to encroach upon or even encompass each other's domains. It's not as though the mind is taken into the body, as conventional appeals to the concept of embodiment tend to imply, or that the mind takes up the world, as implied by the theory of its extension. The fish in the water gives us a better picture, I think, of a whirly-jig world of spiraling movements that run into one another, of thinking spiraling into vortices of sound, into rounded vessels of clay, into the oscillations of the scribal letter line, all of them dynamically sustained formations in the current of life. Well, we've come a long way from Bourdieu and from his understanding of the habitus as a set of dispositions that both generate the mastery of the skilled practitioner and are in turn generated by it, all beneath the radar of conscious awareness. For what we have discovered on the other side of explicit logical articulation is not a lack of awareness, but an awareness of a different kind. It's the awareness of feeling others, feeling you, or in a word, hapticality. And this explains why craftspeople, absorbed into their tasks, by their own report tend to experience their own presence and movement, and the presence and movement of the persons and things with which and with whom they engage, with heightened rather than diminished intensity. Now colloquially, the word we use for this is concentration. And by this, we don't mean the kind of cognitive processing that delivers solutions for implementation. It's not the operation of a joined-up computational mechanism, whether inside the head or extending beyond it. Concentration lies rather in the affective unison of haptic and kinesthetic awareness with the movement and vitality of materials. And the recognition of this other form of awareness, concentrative rather than cognitive, haptic rather than, the, rather than explicit, allows us at last to resolve a question to which the answer has long eluded us. For there is no doubt that many things we routinely do involve no concentration at all. We are often scarcely aware that we are doing them. With these operations, the more practiced we are at them, the less thought and attention they demand of us. They are markedly unresponsive to surrounding conditions, to the extent that if conditions change, they can break down or lead us astray. They seem virtually automatic. In principle, automatic operations could just as well be done by machine, and indeed in the history of technology, they have often been among the first to be mechanized. The question is, how are we to distinguish such automatisms from the practiced mastery of a craft? Now, if no other awareness were possible, save that which reflects and reports on practice from the outside, 
which intrudes into it and holds it, into a, holds it to account, then we would risk reducing craft practice to the level of bodily automatism. It would be negatively characterized by the absence of conscious deliberation. And to an extent, this is precisely what has happened in social scientific writing on embodiment and the tacit dimension. You would think, from reading much of this literature, that there's not much difference between touch typing and performing a Rachmaninoff piano concerto. It may be that the latter is a lot more difficult and takes a great deal of practice that none but the most dedicated musician would willingly endure. However, in both cases, we are led to believe that it is all a matter of leaving the fingers to take care of themselves, freeing the mind for higher things. But if the pianist is truly thinking with his fingers, if his thought flies with the sounds of the keys, if he feels the presence of listeners whose ears stretch to catch every passing sound, and if he and they are truly moved by the experience, then there is all the difference in the world between his performance and, say, that of a player piano that has been mechanically programmed to reproduce the same piece. And the difference is simply this. The master pianist's performance unfolds along a way of telling the machine performance does not. The pianist, as Cage would put it, has nothing to tell but is telling it. All true craft, as I have endeavored to show, is a way of telling. So the ossification of telling in the language of embodiment, its reduction to a kind of sediment, has its parallel in the way we tend to speak of habit. It has become common to treat as habits the things we do unthinkingly and without consideration. They are often regarded as the unwanted detritus of ordinary activity, behaviors that have fallen out of active commerce with the world and become stuck in repetitive patterns that may have meant something once but no longer have significance today. They do not require to be learned so much as unlearned. Usually, they are judged to, to be bad. When did you last hear anyone talking about their good habits? But I believe that there is more to habit than this. For it is a word that speaks more affirmatively of custom, of use, of dress, and even of care. I would like to think of habit, like craft, as a way of telling. And what is most particular to it is the way the practitioner is inside the action. The difficulty with the concept of habit has always been to decide where to place the doer. Are we, so to speak, in front of our habits or behind them? Do we make our habits or do our habits make us? And the problem arises so long as we are forced to choose between the active and the passive voice of the verb. That is, between what we do and what we undergo. But in his reflections on art as experience, the philosopher John Dewey argued that we would do better to understand habit in terms of the relation between the two. Neither in front of what we do nor behind it, we are in the midst. Our doing is also our undergoing. What we do is also done in us. In our intercourse with the world, Dewey explained, we also inhabit the world. Or in a word, we dwell in habit. And this, perhaps, is as good a definition as any of what it means to practice a craft. A way of telling is also a way of dwelling, of inhabiting. Moreover, it is also a way of using. To use something, after all, is to draw it into your habitual or usual pattern of activity. Both you and it become brothers in arms, working together to joint effect. And conversely, to be used to a thing is to accept it into your life as part of your custom. And when what we use is words, ways of telling become ways of speaking. And this brings me to the final part of my, my argument, in which I shift my focus from 
works to words. For most of us, as we go about our lives, words furnish our principal means of telling. With them, we invite others to gather round, converse with them, join our own life stories with theirs, attend and respond to what they say and do. Enriched by the patina of everyday use, ever varying in texture, they rise up in the gestures of the mouth and lips in speech, or spill out onto the page in the traces of the writer's hand. They can be noisy or quiet, turbulent or serene. Words, spoken or handwritten, echo to the pulse of things. They are conducive to rumination and enliven the spirit, which responds in kind. Words can caress, startle, enchant, repel. As the philosopher Brice Merleau-Ponty once put it, there are so many ways we have of singing the world and its praises. We could say that words mediate a poetics of habitation. Yet as we look around, it seems that something has gone seriously wrong in our relations with words. It's as though they have turned against us, or we against them. We routinely hold them to blame for the suppression of feeling, or for failing to account for the authenticity of experience. To get to what it really feels like, we insist we have to get beneath the words or behind them. Words, it seems, are no longer our habit, our custom, or our dress. Rather, they have become the means by which we dress things up, coating them with a gloss that obscures the truth they might otherwise tell if left to be themselves. Now, of course, there are still people who use words to plumb the depths of human feeling. But they have become the purveyors of a specialist and for many an arcane craft. Instead of inhabiting the world poetically, we have created a little niche in the inhabited world for poets. Perhaps no contemporary community has developed more of an antipathy towards words than that which principally works with them. And I mean the community of scholars and above all those scholars who would regard themselves as academics. Scholars are people who study. Academic scholars, however, think of study in a particular way. Far from studying with the world or allowing themselves to be taught by it, they make studies of the world, claiming in so doing to have reached heights of intellectual superiority from which things are revealed with a clarity and a definition denied to ordinary folk. In their discourse, wholly given over to projects of explication Words have been stripped of their power to move, to affect, or to evoke. They are drained of feeling and barred from contact with the things of which they speak. Rather like the instruments of the surgeon, they are kept immaculately clean to prevent any risk of infection. Once infected, a word should immediately be sterilized, lest it should pollute other things with which it might come into contact. If a word too closely associated with one thing is applied to another, then the division between them might become blurred, leading to cognitive dissonance. So in the surgery of academic thought, dedicated to the repair of such dissonances, it is essential that categorical boundaries are maintained, and it is the job of words to do so, to put things at a distance, to pin them down, to impose a discipline, and to hold an otherwise unruly world to account. And this sovereign perspective requires of academics that they keep their distance from the matters of their concern and do not get their hands dirty by mingling with them. This is what they mean by objectivity, and words are the means by which they achieve it. This is why academic words so often sound neutered, their force annulled by a triple lock of suffixes, eyes, eight, and eon. Thus does use, for example, become utilization. 
as I've already mentioned, to use something and to be used to it is to draw it into your custom. Not so, however, with utilization. For to utilize an object is to turn it to one's benefit while holding it at a remove. It is to deny any affective involvement or common feeling. And the same goes for many other weapons of the academic's armory. If they never use anything, if not to utilize, then nor do they say anything, if not to articulate, mean anything, if not to signify, tell anything, if not to explicate. The academic does not feel words welling up in his mouth as he speaks or in his hand as he writes. They do not form as affectations of the soul, nor do they take shape in the inflections of vocal or manual gestures. Words for the academic are objects to be arranged and rearranged like building blocks in different combinations and permutations so as to form sentences. In short, the academic is an articulator of verbal compositions. Now, to articulate, as we have already seen, is to join things up, not to join with them. And that is why the idea of word processing, anathema to the writer's craft, found such a warm reception in the land of academia. If words are objects to be arranged at will, what could be more natural than serving them to a machine for processing? The combination of keyboard, screen, and printer, the typical apparatus of the academic writer, allows for verbal composition without any sentient involvement on the part of those who write with it. The appeal to signification, likewise, is a way of holding the world at a distance. To find what things mean, you only have to work with them. But in a world of signs, we never touch anything directly and feeling is interrupted. Signification breaks the link of direct perception just as articulation breaks the link between hand and word. If meaning is hands-on, signification is hands-off. And so it is too with explication. It's not enough for the academic to tell of what he knows. It must be explicated, spelled out in a joined-up sequence. Every such sequence is a sentence. But sentence has a double meaning. It is also a term of incarceration imposed by a judge. As the criminal is sentenced in the court of law, so words are sentenced in the court of explication. Here in this court, academics are both judge and jury, both author and reviewers. And between them, they conspire to hold all words captive and to prevent their escape into sentient life. And yet, ironically, the very word sentence comes from the same root as sentience and has acquired its current meanings in the fields of both language and law from the repression of feeling. It's a repression clearly for which most academics feel a shadow of guilt. Their tendency, however, is to shift the guilt onto their accessories, that is, onto the words themselves. For having first used words to put things at a distance, they then accuse not just their words, but all words of setting up obstacles, of getting in the way of the unmediated relation with lived experience for which they yearn. Having thus rendered this experience wordless and thus tacit, it is left to sink into the inaccessible depths of the body. And the result is the opposition between verbalization and, and embodiment. The one allegedly explicit, the other tacit, that so much academic analysis has taken at its, as its starting point. My objective to the contrary has been to restore both words and habits, both ways of speaking and ways of telling, to hapticality. Habits are no more sedimented in the body than words liberated from it. Rather, both words and habits are animate. They are ways of being alive. So let's not be afraid to meet the world with words. Other creatures do it differently, but verbal intercourse has always been our human way and our entitlement. 
Words are human things. But let these be words of greeting, not of confrontation, of questioning, not of interrogation or interview, of response, not of representation, of anticipation, not of prediction. This isn't to say that we should all become poets or novelists, let alone that we should seek to emulate philosophers who, when it comes to their worldly involvements, have signally failed to practice what they preach and for whom neither coherence of thought nor clarity of expression has ever been amongst their strongest suits. But it does mean that we scholars should work our words as, as craftspeople work with their materials in ways that testify in their inscriptive traces to the labor of their production and that offer these inscriptions as things of beauty in themselves. Thank you very much. Alors, euh, et euh, notre formidable traductrice instantanée fonctionnera dans les deux sens. Donc n'hésitez pas à prendre le micro, <rire> il va circuler. Euh, qui le souhaite, qui veut prendre la parole C'est difficile après autant de bruit. Mais... <rire> Thank you very much for this uh, presentation that was just as rich as the, the various books and articles that I've been lucky enough to, to read from you. Uh, I have a lot of admiration for all your work and for what you presented today, and I want to thank you for the, the inspiration that you brought. Uh, as I was listening today also, I was thinking of another side that maybe I, I'd like to, to question or to have you uh, develop. Um, Would you agree that a lot of what you said today and a lot of what you've been working on from lines on is about, I would say, proximity, about continuity, about um, uh, fitting in an environment, dwelling uh, a continuity with this environment, hapticality also, the sense of touch obviously means proximity and continuity. Um, attention also, care and attention means you do this for something that is touching you, close to you, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I was thinking of uh, a few um, passages wherein uh, Deleuze, whom I know you, you very much read also, uh, insists on the vacuum, on the brain needing some sort of a vacuum or uh, intelligence needing a moment where you don't respond, not the responsibility where in continuity with the question that you were asked or the situation that you are in, you uh, bring something to the situation in continuity with it, but says, no, uh, for Bergson and for what I'm interested in, we need that moment of break, that moment of distance, not only along, but either above or even against. Uh, And how uh, does one fit within the continuity of your thought and within this care for proximity, the need which is also, I think, present in our uh, modern age to go up, to look at things from above, and maybe sometimes even to break, even if it goes against a certain continuity in life. Thank you very much. What you say is true. Um, and I have wanted to stress the the continuity and, and, and the engagement. Uh, and and I, I often receive the criticism that, that where is the conflict, where is the rupture, where is the break? And, and my response to that is that you can't have a rupture, you can't have a break unless there is something to break in the first place. That is in, in some sense, the continuity has to come ontologically prior to the break. Uh, and, and therefore I, I'm, I find myself somewhat opposed to many colleagues who want really to focus on almost exclusively on the dissonances of life. I think you've, you've got to start with that continuity. And for the same reason, too, 
um, I want to start with direct perception. Um, and I'm therefore arguing against those who argue that everything is signs. Uh, if everything were signs, then we'd never see anything directly. And obviously there is a lot of indirect perception, but that you can't have the indirect without the direct, and the direct has to be, rather like Marx said, you can't have consumption without production. You've got to, you, you have to have that, that there first before you can talk about, about the break. So, ça c that was Yves Citon, who is uh, yes, right. introducing the tra French translation to your last yes. book on education. Est-ce que vous pouvez tous vous présenter quand vous parlez la parole, comme ça, Tim sait aussi uh, d'où vous posez la question Thank you very much. I'm Gabriele Sofia. Um, I, I work at the Department of uh, Performing Arts. So, um, I, thank you very much. I have a lot of questions, but I, I ask just one, and, and is that, um, do you, have you ever put this reflection uh, in connection with all the study about uh, body schema, or about uh, what uh, Sean Gallagher called the body schematic process? Um, just that. If you see a, a connection or a if you're... Connection, do I see a connection with what I was saying and work on, on yes. the body schema? Yeah. I haven't thought about it. There could be a connection with the body schema, but, but, but the, 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 the fundamental thing is that I, I want to think of the body as primarily animate. So it's, it's, it's the liveliness of the body that counts and therefore uh, and therefore the body is more like a, a system, it's not anatomical, it's not an anatomical thing, it's more like a, a, a system of affects, and as such a system, it continually kind of runs beyond itself. So any sort of body schema is like the way dancers often talk about it, that, that the body isn't just here, it's, it's going up there and going up, if I point my limbs in different directions, it's shooting off in, in lo lots of different directions. And in, in that sense, uh, that sense of the body as a, a bundle of affects, that are shooting off in many different directions, that would tie in with the sorts of things that I was saying, yes. Yeah, Tim, I just, I hear very much Suzanne Langer's dynamic form when you're speaking. The philosopher, the dance philosopher. Yes, yeah, she's, On she form has. I, I read uh, Suzanne Langer's uh, form and feeling, or is it feeling and form, I can't yeah. remember which way around it is, Ma many, many, many years ago. Um, and it, it's kind of left a, an impression, although I haven't gone back to it recently, to the extent of being able to cite chapter and verse. But there's a point, there's a place in that where, where Langer says that art is about giving form to human feeling. And I've always thought that that, that is uh, very beautifully expressed, because I think, also I think that's, that's what it is, um, that the form is not in any sense pre-given, it's emergent, but it emerges, emerges from uh, the, uh, what I call the correspondence, the going along together of, 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 of an awareness and, and materials that it's engaging with. Um, and I think Langer would probably agree with that. So I'd have to check back to the book to see. Yeah, there's also, um Uh, Enzo Neppi from the Italian department. Um, thank you very much for the beautiful uh, uh, lecture. I uh, still have a, one, one question. You stress very much to use one of the expressions that I heard tonight, the continuity. And still I had the feeling to some point that your lecture was very dualistic, very binary. There is uh, mechanics and there is performance. Um, so you were thinking, in a sense, in a Cartesian way and not in this uh, continuity way. You have enemies and you fight against them. Yes, yes. This, is, this is always a problem because, because it's, it's the way, the trouble is that I'm an academic. Uh, and, so, <laughs> and so this is a certain amount of self-criticism in this. I mean, even. I was thinking at the end when I wrote this, and I got this horrible word, hapticality, which I just introduced, and it's actually the worst kind of academic word, and so I'm contradicting myself all along. 
and 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 when you're trained in in this the arts the rhetoric of academic argumentation as you know you set up your 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 thesis and your antithesis your 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 argument a and your argument b and you you set one against the other and through doing so you 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 make a point um, and um, it's very difficult to know how in a in a piece like this where you're trying to make argue for something and against something else, uh, how to avoid that, that dualism. In fact, I don't think it's really avoidable in this kind of thing. And the only way to get to it is to say this kind of thing is preliminary to other kinds of things or a, a commentary on other kinds of things, which is what uh, writers and poets and musicians and artists are actually doing, uh, which is not to set up these these dichotomies. So in a way it's saying um, if we want to join with, with what uh, artists and poets are doing, let's go down this road and not that one. Um, because I'm, I'm so tired of basically art historians. I shouldn't. But, 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 but those who, who say that what we have to do is to put the work that artists or musicians or craftspeople do, understand it by putting it in their context. Because that's putting it away and saying, look, we, we've explained that now. We've, we've held it to account and the job is done. And, and what I want to do is to bring things back into presence so we can engage with them directly. So I don't know how to do it except by putting in this opposition between me uh, all thinking the right way and all those other people thinking the wrong way. It's I don't know how to do it. I pulled your mic off. Oh, sorry. It's, yeah. It, it You're on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. The mic. One question at the back uh, there and the one here. Uh, hello, um, uh, my name is Fizel Balez. I'm an architect and I'm working on the sense of smell. And, and listening to you, I, I, I was wondering, um, uh, have you thought about uh, the role of um, um, in the habituation? When, when, when you smell something, uh, you are in a, in a smelling ambience. Um, you get, uh, you have a, an adaptation to it, so you you don't smell it anymore. Mm. And I was wondering when I was listening to you that um, in the habitus, some sometime, it's the difference that uh, that may uh, have sense in the crafting. So the 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 sudden, I don't know, you, you use some example with clay, for example, and, and maybe uh, um, not only in smell, but in other senses, it will be the difference that may have sense in the action. So I, I was wondering, have you thought about that? I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, really said, thought, thought much about smell. It, it, it's... Um, which is a, a lack because smell is very Im important. And, and, but I, so I would have to think about it on, on my feet, so to speak. Um, and just thinking about it on my feet, I would imagine <coughs> that, that there are no such things as, as smells. There's only a difference between one smell and another. I think that's what you'd be saying, that, 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 that you could recognize, well, when we say, oh, I recognize a smell, Recognize the smell of gas, or I recognize the smell of a, of a, of a, of a fresh, um, uh, a fresh uh, uh, leaves after rain. Um, that, that, that it's not as though you could objectify and say, oh, there's that smell there, and I picked it up. It's rather that you recognize the, uh, a difference. I, I think that's what you're saying, and it sounds to me absolutely right that that's the way it is. And, and, and then you're suggesting that having once recognized that difference, you might not recognize it as such again. I mean, and I'm not sure whether that's always true. I, I know they, they talk, for example, about the, the real danger of, of what makes carbon monoxide so dangerous, is that you smell it the first time, um, but once that, you felt you'll never smell it again, uh, and therefore you're, it, it's very risky. And I don't know, uh, maybe you know better than I do, whether that's, um, that's obviously the case with carbon monoxide, which is a very specific chemical, but whether that's true of everything. I mean, to me, um, that, that smell of, of, of fresh leaves after rain is not one that having had it once, I don't have it again, I have it every time. And, and it's always um, 
comes with that sense of, of freshness and surprise that makes it so, so beautiful. I mean, it's, like, it's, like, um, it's like hearing a, a, a piece of music, a symphony, say, and you, you've heard it before, now you're hearing it again. Of course, you hear it differently because you've heard it before, but it's not that you don't hear it. Um, so it would be really interesting, actually, and I don't know, but, it, it, but to think about how smell sort of evolves through um, the, the, the re repeated encounter with it uh, over a person's lifetime because, well, you know, that it's a it, it's tremendously powerful evoker of memory. Um, and that's something special, too, about smell. But I'm sorry, I can't argue, answer it better because I've not thought about it in the depth I should have done. Uh, hello, Cherry Schrecker, uh, Sociology. Oh, uh, I see. Um, well, this sort of led into my question, really, because you're talking very much about the way things are in a sort of present. And I was wondering if you were interested or had thought about or had anything to say about how things become what they are. And I was thinking um, mainly, well, about the, in the same way that uh, Berger and Lippmann, for example, describe, you know, socialization and how, how, how we learn these things to, to be in the present, partly, especially the part where you were talking about learning to be inside something. Mm, mm. Well, um, it's, it's not actually in this paper, but I have thought elsewhere about, th about that and about how we, can, how we, should, how we should think about um, learning um, and, and I don't know how to, how to begin with it. I, I, I'm, I'm very much against the sort of classic models of socialization. And so the question, so, and, and we probably are too. I mean, mo most people, I think, uh, would feel unhappy with the standard classical model of socialization. So the, the question is what we, what we put in, in instead. And, and to, the more I think about it, the more dissatisfied I am with the very concept of learning. I, I, I don't like it. It's not some sort of something, when you're, when you're so-called, so speak, learning something, that's not how it seems to you. You're doing something. And, and, um, and, and I've been very much attracted by the concept of study uh, as something one does and what, what it means to actually study um, with, uh, with people, with, with things, and, and how that study um, involves an education of attention. Uh, so, and, and I should, I th that, that's really the case um, in studies, for example, of, of, of craft apprenticeship uh, where somebody is, uh, is starting as a novice in, in pottery, blacksmithing, or whatever, uh, starts from the novice and becomes a, eventually becomes a master. What's going on? They're not learning. They're not being socialized in, into things. But, um, but, but they are learning to notice things and to attent become attentive to things. And then they're learning how to respond to those things in a, in a fluent way. And I want to think about it then as a form of study in which one is taught as much by the things that you're working with or the materials that you're working with as you are by you know, the people um, who, are, who are involved in it as, as well. Yeah. Good evening. Um, I just ask you this question. Uh, I just ask you this question from, a, let's say, an art student point and uh, from a Tai Chi learner. I don't know if you know this discipline. Tai Chi? Oh. And now I just learned this word, ubiquity, and I ask myself how far you are from the mindfulness theories of this kind of research. I'm, I'm, I, I am and I'm not, in the sense that, um, that I, I haven't gone into uh, all this stuff on mindfulness, and I'm, 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 um, I'm skeptical uh, because I, um, I, I don't know much about it, but my, my worry is that, uh, is that mindfulness is currently being marketed as a con consumer good uh, and, and as, a, as a cure for all ills. Um, our, even our, our own, in our place, our own university management has gone in for it. You know, you can sign up for your mindfulness uh, hour a week and, uh, and be relieved of stress and uh, be dumbed down so that you'll obey any other managerial commands that come from them. So, uh, uh, and, and it's being marketed. So I, I, don't, want to go, I don't want to go there. And, and there, there was a time when I actually used the word mindful and I didn't realize that it had become co-opted and, and, 
and, and then now I realize I can't use this word because it's, it's become part of this, um, this, this discourse, which I, I, I don't want to engage with. But people keep telling me um, that there are lots of parallels between what I'm saying and uh, some of the precepts of Buddhism. But since I know virtually nothing about Buddhism, I say, well, that's, that's up to them to figure it out. I, I'm, not, I'm not really bothered. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Chantal Dugave, and I'm making. Uh, I'm an artist and making a research uh, creation creation. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your for your thinking because of uh, for my part, it's, it brings me a lot of things and connection because it's very difficult in, in French to 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 manage to bring this kind of uh, research. And I think uh, your thinking uh, bring a lot of things. But I have a question because in my research, <laughs> I have made my, my, my way. And um, you spoke a lot about the nodal and uh, the connection. And you have making this pretty good uh, drawing with mind, body, and world in your tableau, um, enfin, your, your pictures. And do you know the, the thinking about uh, Jacques Lacan about this exactly these three kind of uh, of uh, mm. sketches? And uh, because he's speaking about the the, the, the existentialism, the bring and the connection with uh, what uh, perhaps you can mm. speak about that because I think it's very interesting. Mm. I've the, discovered the, that. Yeah, thank you. The the honest answer is that I don't. And um, what, what, what happens, and this has happened to me before, um, it, with, with, uh, with, with French uh, philosophers and psychoanalysts and so on, that on my initial encounter with their work, I find them totally incomprehensible. <laughs> uh, and, and this happened with Deleuze, for example. And then I carried on doing what I read, uh, had a, took, took a look at, uh, at Mille Plateau, a thousand plateaus in, in, uh, in English, took one look at it and said, well, this is a waste of time. This, well, I haven't got time to waste reading 300 pages of this complete nonsense, and I put it away. And I got on with what I was doing. And then, um, and I, I went and did it. I wrote a, this book about lines, and I was thinking about lines. And the people kept saying, you know, you really should look at uh, Deleuze. And I said, OK, I'll get it. And then, and then I did, and then, I, damn it, I found that he'd said it all already. Because, because it was only at the point where I had thought it out for myself uh, and worked out the words I wanted to use and the concepts. Only then could I figure out what this guy was saying, because I could translate and say, oh, when I mean this, he means that, and that's what he's saying. And I suspect it could be the same with Lacan. I found Lacan, I just took one look at it and said, no, no, this is, this is I don't, I, I'm not going there. And, and, um, and maybe, you know, having got this far, I did find, for example, Michel Serres writing about the vortex in the birth of physics in a wonderful way, and I don't think that I would have appreciated that unless I had started thinking about this way myself and then come back to it. So probably what you're telling me is right, and that I've now reached the point where I should go back to Lacan and might possibly understand a word of what he said. So, <laughs> um, the you. name is Ne Borromean. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you for your talk. Olivier Labussière, I'm a geographer, uh, quite well influenced by pragmatic uh, thinking. Um, crafting is a way of telling. My understanding is that doing is much more about than doing. It is enjoying, sharing, observing, imagining, and telling, of course. But what kind of language do practices introduce us to? Your talk, to my mind, suggests that the language is multiple. I mean, is enacted in multiple ways, along with the experience. And as such, the language always has a surplus. Things are embarked in the action, and other things are not. What is the status of this surplus? And how is the language um, influenced by it? Thank you, that's a wonderful question. It's really hard to answer. And, and, and it's one that I think geographers in particular, are, or cultural geographers, are, are working at in, 
uh, under the under the aegis of of non-representational theory. That is that there 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 are a lot of experiment. If 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 we feel unhappy, as as many do, um, and I certainly many geograph geographer colleagues I speak to feel happy about the standard language of analysis. Uh, we we need to find a, an alternative that. Um, that, that doesn't set up academic analysis and poetry in completely separate camps. And we can only do that, I think, by, by experiments and trying out different ways of, ways of doing things. There's a lovely book um, which, which I wrote a foreword by Philip Bernini. Uh, it's called Non-Representational Methodology or something like that, which has a, a series of, of experiments in, in writing. They're all different. But they're all trying to tackle the same problem. Is that how do we? It, it is in fact how you deal with this surplus that you were talking about. Um, how do we write in such a way as to be um, scholarly and writerly at the same time? And I, um, I don't have the answer, uh, but I'm working at it. And I think it, at least it's a, it's it's a step forward to recognise that there is a problem, um, that, that as you say, there is much more to doing than just doing. Uh, there's, there, 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 there is the enjoyment, and there is the, oh, sorts of things that, 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 that overflow. And, and if we say that, 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 that it's this overflowing that is really what's important, but we don't want to, but if you capture it, then it's not overflowing anymore. So we have to find a language to deal with that. And I. Uh, I don't yet have it, but the, I, um, one philosopher who's really engaged with this issue, whose work I found inspirational, is Erin Manning. Um, she produced a book, she's a partner of Brian Masumi, who translated Mir Plato, and, and she produced a book just a year or two ago called The Minor Gesture, which in a way is all about that. The Minor Gesture is the, is, is the overflow, uh, and, and how to talk about that. Uh, it's very, very powerful stuff but I don't have the answer yet. Thank you. Any questions left? The, the circle is moving. We had Erin Manning and Brian Masumi here for the first Arts in the Alps okay. uh, summer school mm. last spring. Any, I didn't see all the questions. Should we stream? <laughs> Should we skip? Okay. Said Team Free. Um, it's very much of a gift, Tim, all of your words and sayings tonight, because we are just starting a, a long term, I think, cooperation between the two labs uh, and starting, a, uh, which is something which is kind of normal for choreographers or performers, but less usual for social sciences, which is art uh, practice as research and uh, recherche création. So we are engaging into this surplus. We have lots of work in progress together, um, starting tomorrow with our workshop and many more to come, uh, hopefully. And I think we have ver been very inspired by your um, words and uh, proposals. So maybe you have a final word. Yes, and, and we I just really want to thank you very yeah. much, very warmly. Thanks, Tim, and merci à tout le monde pour votre présence ce soir. Et euh, on a appris, là, aujourd'hui, ou c'était hier soir, qu'il y a un euh, doctorant qui va faire un postdoc ici, one of your post, euh, qui va arriver en avril de l'Université d'Aberdeen, qui a commencé en art, et après, il a commencé en art, et puis il a été en anthropologie. Et il, termine, il continue sur le CDP Trajectories, alors voilà, tout va bien. <rire> L'Université de Grenoble est bien, euh, bien reliée avec l'anthropologie, en tout cas, elle commence à l'être mieux. Ouais. Et euh, on espère pouvoir envoyer certains de nos étudiants à Aberdeen aussi. En tout cas, vous êtes les bienvenus. Mm. Merci encore Merci pour, cette pour belle la soirée. Don. Merci. Bravo pour la traduction. <rire> Et merci pour... Euh, donc, c'était enregistré et ça va être euh, mis en ligne en, en traduction en français et en anglais. Merci pour toute l'équipe pour euh, la mise en, mise en scène de ce soir et euh, à très, très bientôt. Voilà. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Au revoir.